Welcome to the Refs Need Love 2 podcast, a place where you get a real, raw, a behind-the-scenes view of the hardest job on the pitch, the referee. This week, a really interesting chat with a gentleman named Ahmed Rahan. He is actually a referee in Scotland, and we got together to kind of compare notes. I actually had a call with the English Referees Association last week, so I'm sporting that. In front of that, I was having a conversation with some of my friends in the UK and what it's like being a ref over there. A little different from Scotland to England, um, but I think you're going to find the conversation fascinating about how they get assigned, how they get paid, and what it's like working over in Scotland as a ref. So uh, sit back, relax, listen up. I'm sure you're going to enjoy And if you don't already follow Ahmed on TikTok, just look him up. He's called The Football Referee. Really wonderful guy. He's got a newsletter as well. Um, definitely check him out, and I'm sure you will enjoy Thank you so much for dialing in. I will say this week's chat was done via Zoom, so it's not the best audio quality, um, but I think the content is really good and it outweighs uh, the poor mono mono sound that you get over Zoom. Have a wonderful day, and I'll talk with you soon. Well, Ahmed, such a wonderful pleasure to get to meet uh, another referee on the other side of the pond, and not just another referee, but a referee who has taking the bold and courageous action to put themselves out there on social media to kind of share a little bit of behind the scenes of what it's like being a ref, um, you know, some of the things that we deal with, some of the challenges, but also the love for being a ref. So, you know, so thrilled to have an opportunity to get to connect with you today. Well, thank you very much for inviting. And it's a, it's a great honor uh, to, to actually speak to you live, not just watch your videos. And you're actually speaking back to me, not just me just watching your videos. So. <laughs> I know. Same here. I think it's, it's probably been too long. I know you and I have connected um, just in messages and chats and supported each other. As all referees should, my gosh, it should be a, a community of like-minded people. I will say, you know, everywhere I go, you know, forget about the social media, but in the seven years before I started, you know, yeah. having a public profile, you know, when you step onto a pitch, uh, you never know who you're going to be, who's going to be on your crew, you know, who you'll meet, but you're always fast friends. I mean, it's just like you have a, a shared experience, a shared history, you know, you're, you're there to do a job together and immediately you're aligned. Even if you've only known each other for 30 seconds, I've got your back, you've got mine. Yeah. So it's, it, I'm, I'm not surprised we could hang out and be friends. Exactly, because we, <laughs> we, we know what it's like to be in, in the middle and we've lived the same experiences. So we click straight away. And that's what is beautiful about refereeing. It's like a community. As soon as you become an AR for somebody, um, you know, you know exactly what they're looking for and you can sympathize with their position. Okay. So love it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I wanted to uh, go over a couple items. I have a, a conversation coming up with the English Referees Association uh, next week. Now, in <laughs> I know everyone kind of runs their operations a little bit differently all around the world. U.S. definitely, even in our 50 states, the United States is different, even between leagues. My gosh, I, yeah, every weekend I go out to the pitch, there's probably going to be some difference in substitutions or how they wow. handle check-ins or whatever, all that kind of stuff. But um, going across the pond, I think there are a lot of differences as well. So I was hoping to just pick your brain and hear a little bit about your experiences okay. and how you go about being a ref in a, in a different okay. country. So why don't we go ahead and start with how do you get assigned to games? Okay, so the level that I'm refereeing is the amateur level, so the adults, which will be 18 plus age group. Right. So at that age group, you're assigned your fixtures from your league. So you, you first of all, you, you sign up to a league. If they accept you, then you become part of the referees and they just put the, uh, the fixtures on the website. Now, what happens with that? The home team, it's their responsibility to contact the referee. Um, so you'll get a text um, probably on a Wednesday for like a, a weekend game. Um, and they'll just say, hi, just to confirm, this is the location um, and this is the kickoff time. And not even the strip colours, to be honest with you. It's quite casual in that way. And that's it. So I'll receive a text message. So I've possibly not been on the, the league table all year because all I'm interested in is uh, location and time and that's the way I see it and um, lots of other refs will go and they monitor the league table they'll know who's winning who's losing for me I'm interested in location and time and um, mm. when we, when we get there home team is responsible for payment payment is uh, back in the day it used to be cash nowadays it's more just bank transfers um, if anything, if a team was not to pay you, um, you would just go back to your league 
and you'll just say so and so is not paying me and they'll be on it so you have that protection when it's the league when it's a friendly it's a little bit more difficult because you're off your own back so what you want to do when it's a friendly is get paid in advance number one um, because you have no protection so that's always a little bit of a worry and you want to make sure you're doing teams that you know if it's two random teams and I've been put in a situation where as a young referee I it was a heated game and the team didn't pay me and then it was at the end of the game and you don't want to be put in a position which I put myself in which goes I went into the changing room it's a losing team they're due me the money and there's a coach sat right at the back with his boys on the bench like this arms out and I go in and I say hey I need you know I need paid and he says he looks up and says uh, make me and he said I'm like oh my god I've put myself in the lines then because he's got all 20 of his teammates around him and I go in and he says make me ah so that put me in a very bad situation that was my first season so from there onward I learned um how to handle that whole money situation either get paid in advance um don't you, you kind of have to be very nice to the the, the captain throughout because you're like oh, he's got my money is he going to pay me i'm not i'm not at that situation anymore because i know the teams and i've got a bit more credibility but definitely as a young ref you, you're in a vulnerable position if you have to go into a changing room and ask for your money at the end because you have to basically Gosh. go in begging and they can just say whatever, whatever they want you're open to hear all their feedback um, but generally, that is how fixtures are assigned via text. That's crazy. Just via but text I, message. That sounds so fan, uh, like far out of my possible world. That is so different from how we do it here in the U.S. I how, can't even how do you describe. Do it? How do you do it? Well, so first off, I mean, it, it, just for regular league like academy. Like, let's talk about you know, thirteen to eighteen year old academy. I, I don't do a lot of recreational games, and then I also have what I would call adult amateur. I don't do adult rec. I can't stand it. Can't handle the crybabies. Adult <laughs> amateur. You know, they, they, they actually have practices. These guys have all played at a high level before. You know, it's right below semi-professional, which would be like, you know, you're probably like seventh, eighth, ninth tiers in England or in, maybe, I don't know, fourth or fifth in Scotland. Um, but those are the types of games I do. But I get assigned for those matches a month in advance for academy stuff, maybe about three weeks. And, what I, and everything's computerized. So I have a few different assigners that I work with who assign for a league. So for MLS, which we are professional uh, league here for you know the, the pros, they have an academy system. That's yeah. like a development academy system with you know many large clubs that participate. And there's one person who assigns for that league. And then there's another league and there's one person who assigns for that league and, and so on and so on. So I choose what um, leagues I want to be available for what dates and times I want to be available for, and I, I, you know, they know me. I've ref for many years, and you know, probably at, at a minimum two, but usually four weeks in advance, my calendar is filled up for the time that I'm available, and the rates are online. <laughs> like you can wow. see what the rates are for each each league, and then I just get paid. I, like when I do my job, I can see my earnings, and two weeks later, I get a check in my bank account. I never have a conversation with people about pay. Now, I, now, every now and then there'll be a friendly, um, mm -hmm. but it's always, you know, cash in advance yeah. <laughs> before we kick off. <laughs> cash is in my hand. Wow. I'm, I'm, I, and, you know, it's the two team managers, whatever, that I'm getting it from. It's not a question of, you know, will yeah. someone pay me after the match? Wow. But, that yeah, is... It's rare that I'd ever have to get involved in payments. And the thing that kills me is like, I don't understand how you plan your days if you're only getting assignments oh. and random people are contacting you on a Wednesday. Like, yeah. how do you build out your schedule to have, all right, I want a 9 a.m., I want 11 a.m., I want a 1 p.m., and I'm gone at 3. Um, you know, in yeah, that way, crazy. because the, the league fixtures are set to, it could be a 2 p.m. kickoff. So you know yep. it's going to be an afternoon kickoff, 1 or 2 p.m. kickoff. So it's going to be between one of those two times. Uh, and that's basically it. You don't know your location yet. I mean, I could check the website, but I just, I'm too busy with work. I'll just let the fixture wow. come to me, and I'm just available. Um, yeah. And over the time, I've told the league association what um, area in the city that I'm most likely to be available, like close to home. We don't get paid like petrol or fuel. I just want to be doing it near my home. So roughly, it's about 20 minutes away, the field. So yeah. generally, that's how we get assigned them. 
Um, but yeah, that's it's so interesting. That's actually a big difference too between the U.S. and in in England or Scotland. Um, the geography is so gigantic here in the United States, like in my city of Atlanta. So we now have uh, the worst traffic in the country. It is. It was started as kind of a suburban city when it went through its boom, and you know now we've got a couple million people here. And to go from the south side of Atlanta, where I live, I live kind of in the the southern suburbs down by the airport, to the northern suburbs of Atlanta without traffic is about an hour to 20, hour, 30 minute drive. So a 60 mile, 70 mile drive, that's how big the geography is. So for us, if you're, you know, going to be a working referee here, you have to be like, all right, I'm going to work at these fields. I'm going to work at these fields and I'll work at these fields. I know the type of games that play at these fields. You know, there's some, cause like there are certain academies that play here um, and they bring in kids or that's those fields of recreation. So I'm going to be at these fields. I know I can be there in 20 minutes time. Cause I don't get paid mileage either for American high school, a whole yeah. different pay structure. And they do pay high school and college pays for, I mean, they do pay for, for mileage, but yeah. for my games, I don't get paid. So I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I have a drive that's relatively short and relatively easy. But I think yeah. what you're talking about are what I would consider to be Sunday league adult amateur matches where you're doing one center in a day. You're um, doing one center or you can yeah. do morning league as well, which is 10 a.m. So that's still adults. Yeah. So when I first yeah. got started, I used to do four games a weekend. I used to do 10, yeah. a, 10 a.m. and then 2 p.m., 10 a.m., 2 right. p.m. Um, so I, I generally don't do kids football. I've done that mm-hmm. for the first season just to get um, into it. But I hate yeah. parents. And the game, the game time is so flexible. Start, you know, it's like a nine to nine fifteen, nine twenty kickoff. I'm like, I came early and I focused for the nine o'clock kickoff, and it's so casual and lax. I'm like, I just like my adults where we can just come straight bang on. I know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, so I generally move away from the kids' game. I have been taking them quite recently, but mm-hmm. I don't physically get a workout doing the kids' game. Mm-hmm. Um, we could talk about money, why structure, and um, the yeah. adults games is 50 pounds um sterling so that's okay for an hour and a half the kids is 40 pounds for 60 minutes so Mm -hmm. that's pretty good as well and we don't get mileage we don't get anything like that but because it's 20 minutes away half an hour away from my my house it's very very reasonable and it's very easy to commute um we also have a structure which i tell uh, some of my students is when you get the contact details of these uh, coaches, I put them in a WhatsApp group, right? So I've got a WhatsApp mm-hmm. group of 45 to 50 um, coaches. And now what happens now for pre-season, I keep messaging people, okay, I'm available at this time, this weekend, I've, I've got space. So now come pre-season, all of these teams want about three or four games pre-season. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. before pre- the season begins, I could do 20 games, um, friendlies. Wow. Um, just because if you become the go-to referee, they're going to come to you because your communication's mm-hmm. easy. They like your style. And mm-hmm. that's it. It's like building your own business in a way. You, it's yeah. just your own contacts because the league doesn't get involved with friendlies. So right. it's up to you to build your contact list. And that's exactly how I do it. So I've got about yeah 40 to 50 um, teams. And that's exactly how I get extra extra games. The, the league season is about 40 to 50 mm-hmm. games, including cup. Mm-hmm. My first couple of seasons when I was single and free, I'd done 120 games a season that's what yeah. i was getting through so it's possible yeah. to make good money for the for the youngsters out there that want it oh uh, no doubt i mean my son paid for his own iphone paid for his own car through referee money and it, it was just it was great because you know we we started repping together so i knew i was going to have to go to the field when he was he started repping at 10 years old wow. that was it used to be the law the rules here it could be 10 years old to start now they've raised it to 13 there are some recreational leagues that will have like a referee and training below that um but yeah no we would you know bang them out and we do four <laughs> matches in a day wow. you know again we're talking recreational or lower level academy i'm certainly not doing four centers in a day i can tell you that <laughs> um yeah and then for adult amateur matches like that you're talking about we would do one or two uh in a day and i would do one center and one line and, uh, um but they'd be back to back you know 10 a.m 12 yeah, noon that's what i like back to back yeah. i don't like having hours in between and it's no. just dead time you can't do anything and one other yeah. thing you guys get paid a lot more than us um but 
Yeah. It, it, yeah, it does. Now, I will say we also have a lot more expenses that you guys don't have. So I like, you know, the shirt that you're wearing. Okay, so that you've chosen that shirt, that color that might be alternative color, and maybe you have black as your standard go-to shirt, but you can buy it through any manufacturer and you just put, you know, a badge onto it. That's great. We have specific uniforms that we have to buy. And there's actually a specific supplier that you're recommended that you should be buying if you want to move up and really look professional this company called official sports and each one of those tops is about 35 45 dollars with shipping you're expected to have a short sleeve and a long sleeve they want everyone to look uniform on the pitch there are five different colors that you need you have to have specific branded black shorts the branded black socks you like there are a lot of things that go into the expenses of being a referee here uh, that may not be incurred um, in England as okay. well. Uh, so it's it's kind of interesting. There are a few things that we have to deal with that you guys don't. Okay. And again, those distances are significant. I mean, it could be totally normal for someone. I'll be refing with someone here on the south side, and they've driven you know an hour and 20 minutes to come from the north side of Atlanta down That's here crazy. for a match. Right. So a couple of differences then. So the distance is definitely one. If you want to do a higher level here, um, you will travel a lot. Like the guys that are doing the premiership, they can travel a couple of hours, you know, because, oh, yeah. you know, if they're living in the south of, of the country and they want to do like, um, you know, professional games, Manchester United, they're going to Certainly, travel. Okay. And yeah. even at our level, if you want to get to the semi pro, the team, you have to go to the teams. When you're at the grassroots level that I'm at, I just go to my closest one because the distance doesn't make a difference. The quality of teams right. are going to be the same. Uh, mm. In regards to the uniform, so I am wearing an, an official top with the logo. Now, nice. we have to, we also have to go to, there's an official supplier as well. Okay. Okay. So there is yeah. official supply. And now these tops do cost about £40 pounds, uh, sterling. Mm. So it's the same as you guys. We do need to wear the branded items. Again, if you want to get promoted and it, and it look good, you want to wear exactly the same things. Now, here's the difference from Scotland to England. England, they all have different badges for the counties. Mm, okay, so this is what I was right, speaking to right. one of the, the young referees then in England. So yeah. they that represents their county, mm. not the Premiership referees. Now, here in Scotland, right. the badge I'm wearing and the uniform I'm wearing is the same one the guys on TV are wearing in Scotland. So we can wear and feel like the professional referees on TV. That's cool. Uh, yeah, and that's why we pay the £45 and, and we need to wear the branded. And it makes you feel better. It makes you look oh, yeah. better. Um, but England is different. They, they're, they're not allowed to wear the ones that are in the premiership they're not allowed to wear that so mm. there's the difference i've just heard that this week actually <laughs> yeah there, there's different ones i mean there are some knockoff brands of the official ones um that you can wear here again for lower level matches but as soon as you want to start working those higher level academy games and start moving up the we have a you know a pyramid if you will uh and moving up as a referee you've got to have all of the official kit like everything has got to look perfect you know i mean and i totally get that you know how you look your professionalism you know is a big part of what they're looking for as they're promoting a referee i mean our mls professional uh referees like premiership have certainly all their own uniforms and and different badges and, all and they get provided for there. and it gets provided yeah, yeah. for them yeah right oh yeah. absolutely it's all bit... the flags you know the comm systems everything is provided for them it, it, for for everything below pro so the way it works here we have a grassroots which is everyone who's not been promoted to a regional badge it used to be just like over in europe where there would be like a grade nine eight seven six and you'd move up from there now they've made it I don't really understand it. You could have someone who's ref for 20 years. They're phenomenal, phenomenal, can handle any adult match, even semi-pro, and they are still considered to be a grassroots referee if they have not gotten their regional badge and keep that regional badge up every single year. So there's costs that are involved, um, significant costs. That's one thing that's a little bit of a difference. If you want to move up here in the U.S., um, you have to actually pay for assessments. Those assessments are $110. So literally your game fee, you yeah. know, and then some for a match, you have to pay for someone to come and tell you how crap they think you are, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, give them your whole game fee. And I believe you need three of those each year to wow. um, be able to maintain or move up in the, the rankings from grassroots to regional, regional to 
um, national, national to Pro 2 and the Pro 1. Um, but it gets more expensive as you go. There's fitness tests and fees that you need to pay for too. Um, no one ever comes out to just do general developmental assessments mm -hmm. for you. You never see a mentor at the field <laughs> or a coach, a referee coach at our fields, just giving uh, feedback. It's very rare. There are some recreational clubs who do it where, you know, it's brand new referees. It's like their first day <laughs> and they'll have some mentors at the field just to help them make sure they don't go home crying. Um, <laughs> but if you're, if you've been working for years, uh, the only way you're getting an assessment is if you're paying over a hundred dollars to have someone come and do it. So now that's a huge difference. See, referee and you get the basic exam here in Scotland, it's like 30 pounds to do the online course. Now you're into the system. Now, the only thing stopping yeah. you from being promoted is first of all your fitness level so you need to right. go to the associations be involved and then you'll get assessors that will come out to watch you for free okay they'll come out and watch you for free and based on their feedback and based on your fitness and your performance you will then naturally get promoted over the years there's none of this like i should start appreciating the assessors that come out more um, if, uh, if in america it's over a hundred pounds or dollars that's so yeah. expensive. That's no it's wonder see, you deserve see, the money. Yeah, no. I reffed a game last weekend here. It was the fourth tier of American soccer. So semi-professional. Like they're getting room and board and stuff like that. We're not getting a big salary beyond that. Um, but, you know, and these guys are have aspirations to play um, professional. There'll be some guys on there who play on some smaller national teams, you know, from other countries and things like that. They play college soccer here, uh, university soccer, if you will. Um, but I had guys drive up six hours from Florida to yeah. come, you know, work a match here to get an assessment by an assessor here. I mean, the, the amount of money that a referee spends here to try and move up mm. the, the ladder to get to those higher level games is significant. Um, and it's a shame. I mean, we have again, we have a very fragmented system for football in general here in the United States. We have 50 different state associations and then there are leagues the highest level leagues don't participate in those state associations they have their own entire structures all to themselves the mls next the ecnls the pdls mm. they do not go up to u.s soccer so they don't pay dues into u.s soccer so the you know and there's again all of these 50 associations they're not getting funding <laughs> from u.s soccer in general which are oh its uh, own crazy thing it's, yeah. it's a wild it's a wild system, but it definitely doesn't um, it doesn't amount to better training and better development for referees. I'm so jealous when I see um, some associations, the English Referees Association, the state of California on the west coast of the U.S., monthly webinars with you know professional referees analyzing laws of the game, situational analysis. You know they'll, yeah. they'll look back over you know the previous World Cup, or they'll look and they'll have things after the Women's World Cup, and they'll analyze key decisions. I wish more of that was available. Man, if it was available, you and I wouldn't have to do what we're doing. <laughs> Indeed. I mean, do you guys have weekly trainings in your... No. Wow. No. See, no. for us in Scotland here, and I, I believe in England, it depends actually what county you are in England, but here in Scotland, we're fortunate that every city has weekly training where we can go and do running with professional guys that you see on the TV and monthly we have a physical monthly meeting as well where there is a PowerPoint there is reviewing the decisions of the last few weeks and talking points so I you know nothing 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 wow. nothing you pay your hundred dollars and you take an online you know four or five hour research at the beginning of the year or it's like a five or six hour first time certification online Mm. online some states will have about like an in-person in class like three or four hour session and then you're out so like so for me personally who by the way i'd love to be developed and you, you can see i'm a lifelong learner i love learning i learned something new every day I found something last night the laws of the game had no idea just so excited about that so cool yeah nothing when i get my online certification in summer okay yeah. i will get zero training zero development opportunities all the way through the year. My state did not even do a fitness test this year. For those who were looking to wow. do up, we did not even get the opportunity to do a fitness test. I want to be a mentor. No mentor class is offered. I mean, nothing. And so, again, people wonder why the state of officiating yeah. you know, is so rough and we lose so many officials. Well, if you don't develop them, you don't invest in them, you don't help them be more confident in the laws of the game and teach them how to apply the laws of the game, guess what? Yeah. You'll lose them. And it sounds like there's no roadmap or support system laid out in front of you that you can step through. Wow. So, wow. 
So I'm going to really give a shout out to the local association here in Scotland. Yeah. Then you know this is huge. Um, I'm sure if they're listening, um, yeah, we guys have got a lot to benefit from um, in the UK as a whole. I felt like there wasn't a very structured approach, but now listening to you, we have it very easy. We have it laid out. Yeah, to be honest that. with you, we do have it laid yeah. out. We just need to put in the effort, and you just need to be seen um, to yeah. be putting in the effort. So wow. It- it's wonderful. Yeah. No. Listen. I, I. I. I will. I'm sure. You know that the United States is not at the bottom of the pile in terms of development. And, and let me tell you. So just this past weekend, I was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, north of New Orleans. You know, it's right in the center of the country, hot and humid as anything. Um, but there, that was regional. So the ten best referees, pretty much from each state in that region of the country. So about ten or twelve states go to regionals, and they get training, and they get assessments. And they get development, and they're surrounded by the most professional referees that we have in the country, the best assessors. One match I was watching had six assessors watching that one match for someone who had aspirations of going national. And I'm like, he wasn't that good. But, <laughs> but at least he got the feedback that he wasn't that good. That being said, so that the creme de la creme, that next level up, yes, there is training and development there. But that is the... Point zero one percent of referees in this country. So how do you get to that level? How do you get seen or pointed out to be that you know point percent? Yeah. yeah. So you you have to be you know actively working hard to get assigned to the top level matches and the top level leagues, um, and and being at that place, and then they will come see you. Now again, what they're looking for is they're looking for someone who's eighteen to twenty six years old, right? Who looks the part. Okay, so they're fit. They show up, they look professional. They all pretty much have the same haircut. It's like really, really tight, short. Like really high fade, too. A lot of the guys, the girls, obviously. No, they got hair. But, you know, I mean, it's a certain look. Your and face has to fit. get identified. Your face, right. We kind of have that as well. Identified. We have that here as well. If your face doesn't fit, it doesn't matter what you do. If you don't fit the kind of profile of the person. And unfortunately here, there's a little bit of, I feel there's a bit of a, a stereotype. It depends on your profile, like your job, your race a little mm-hmm. bit as well. Um, yeah. I feel, crazy. yeah, there's a little bit of that, but generally all the guys at the top look the same and you'll see that yeah. in, at the same. Yeah. It's a challenge. I mean, I think I, I want to give some credit to the U S soccer association here and even my Georgia state association. Um, the efforts to uh, promote and develop, people from diverse backgrounds. So women, you know, other ethnicities and minorities always, always are getting the opportunity to center and run lines on the highest level matches. And, and let me say as a, as a privileged, you know, Caucasian old white man, yes, I'm totally cool with that. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I want to see people represented from all backgrounds, you know, who love the game of football to be seen in the center of the pitch as the person officiating the game as well. So I think when when you go to these higher levels, you know, here in, in the United States, when you, when you see the highest level of university, uh, NCAA um, college games, the professional matches, and at the MLS, I think you see a pretty well represented group of people, not from all backgrounds, not from all backgrounds, I, I would say, um, but it, it's starting to look a little bit more like our population here yeah. in the U.S., where it was not 10 years ago. So I got to give a little credit to those at the top who have made those choices Good. very intentionally. Like I had a situation Good. two weeks ago. I was working a high-level MLS Next match, and the woman that I was – it was a woman who was working with me. So I love, love her. Love her, love her, love her. Such a great referee. Um, but it was – I think it might have been like a – I don't think it was an MLS. It was a, it was like a U19 women's match. It was a highly competitive, you know, older age group academy women's match. And she loves working the men for whatever reason, you know, the women, not as big fan. And she wasn't feeling her best. And she said to me, it was like, hey, do you mind covering this for me? So I texted, oh no, our assigner was there. It was a state cup, state cup final. Yeah. So I texted, you know, the assigner and yeah. it was like, Mike, hey, I'm going to take over the center for this next one. All good. And he got like, pissed <laughs> he was upset he's like i assign people based on you know my experience and what i think is best for the match and it is important that those young girls on that field see that women referee in that match yeah. and i was like okay, okay dude okay. i'll run the line no problem <laughs> you're like whatever you want yeah you just what, what, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm just trying to help yeah, exactly. so i will say at the highest levels 
that kind of stuff has happened. Okay. Um, for the 99%, nothing. And, and that's really the, the big challenge is for all of those people who are being left behind. And, you know, I mean, I know my son, you know, if I had not been with, there with him and going through that experience with him, there's no way he would have stuck with, with refing for seven or eight years. There's no way. Yeah. There's no way. I mean, it is, it is intense. And it's, it's really intense. I remember the first time he had to caution a coach. And, you know, I mean, it was, this guy was just being an, an ass. And I was mm. uh, on the AR2. I was on the other side of the field. Um, but you know, there was like a stoppage of play and, you know, I just, <laughs> I called him over. It's like, Hey, now's the time. <laughs> yeah. like, here, here are the words, you know, this is, this is what you say. And this is what, what you're going to do. You know, coach, you're engaged in public persistent dissent, you know, I'm giving you a caution right now. If you do not stop, there'll be further consequences, but he had to have someone there helping him. And most people don't have that. Most people just get the abuse, the abuse, the abuse, the abuse, they go home they cry. They're like, I'm never doing that again. Yeah. That was awful. And uh, it's really a, a shame. A question on that. How do you feel as a father seeing your son abused by a fellow grown man? Like, how, how does that feel? It's, it's a great question. So I, I feel being a referee is, um, is, is great preparation for life. And so, listen, I mean, I, I've had experiences with my son on the pitch where I've had to, he was, he had someone come take a like a full field, like run at him to, to beat him up, and I had to get in the way of that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So listen, I, I've had that, and my dad, you know, instincts came out with yeah. claws to, to fight back. Exactly. But also, I'm like, you know, in every part of life, personal life, professional life, you're going to have people who are difficult to to deal with, and it's not, you know, what happens to you, it's how you react to it. And you know, he was in a situation, you know, you know, this. this Parents, the spectators, as kids, it's a young kids' match. It's a U twelve recreational match for gosh sakes. <laughs> and so, you know, it was important for him to be no, no, have some self respect. Yeah, you know, you're gonna, you've got the power here. You're not gonna take that. Here's the, you know, the words and the caution, and go do it. And I can tell you, my son, if you ask anyone, <laughs> any of his teammates, any of his friends, the way they talk about my son. You know, he is the most mature, most kind, you know, like generous person. And I think a lot of that, like that inner strength of that maturity comes from all that time on the pitch. You know, all of those times where there have been challenging situations and difficult situations and high intensity, you know, but he had to remain calm. Yeah. He had to be, he had to hold his chill, you know, and he had to make sure that he was being mature and delivering that message in the right way, you know, with confidence and composure. So I am, ex I, you know, I don't like that someone was acting like an idiot. That's not good. But I'm really happy with how my son responded. To that. It's, it's a great life development, isn't it? Because this young people are, are generally, the first time they see that is in the workplace in an office somewhere. And, yeah. you know, it's not a great environment to be in but as a referee you just have to put up with things that you have to hold your tongue a lot you have to control right. your emotions when people right. around you cannot control their emotions yeah. and it's crazy to see when somebody loses a ball and they want to kill the other person and you're like oh my god this is we're, you know we're not millionaires we're not getting paid yeah. this is meant to be fun for you on a sunday afternoon and you want to kill yeah. somebody over it uh, I, could, I, could, I, Ahmed, I could not agree more. I always try and tell people like my kids, my teammates, you know, I, I manage a team of people too. It's like, you know, when things are getting crazy, you know, when there's a lot going on, there's a lot of pressure, calm down, take a breath, getting crazy and starting to just be reactive, whatnot yeah. is not going to be helpful at all. And when someone is angry and yelling at you, man, the best thing you can possibly do to that is be like, are you okay? <laughs> it's yeah. like, hey, take a breath, man. I, I'm a human. You're a human. You know, let's 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 try and work this thing out. Um, escalating it never helps. I, I don't. I don't think there's anything positive could happen for a referee if they try and match the intensity <laughs> yeah. and the anger of a player, a coach, a parent. Nothing could happen. And, and I think about a couple of the times early in my refereeing career where I, I reacted like that. Yeah. And dude, that doesn't help. Doesn't help. <laughs> it's not going to help in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. And so I and, and I'm not saying people have to walk around with a big smile on their face and be all happy, go lucky. You know, that I don't think that's possibly the best thing you want to do if you want to have control of, of a match. But being confident and calm and composed and mature and modeling the behavior that you want to see is Indeed. always good thing. The, the, the only time I have regret on my performance or my actions in a game is when a player has made me lose control of my emotions. So if a player has got under my skin 
Um, if I've made a mistake, a genuine mistake, fine. But if a player, sometimes these players are nagging at you for 70 minutes and sometimes you just lose the plot and you comment back and it's something that then it was a bit insulting or not professional, let's say. That's the only time I regret and think, that guy got under my skin actually. Um, that's the only time, genuinely, that's the only time. Um, it's really frustrating because I look back and I've let myself down. Um, anyone else would have started a fight. You know, these guys want to yeah. fight for the smallest thing. And I've done okay for 70 minutes getting it in the ear. You're this, yeah. you're that, etc. And it's not even like anything you could give dissent to because it's just been quite casual. Um, but after 70 minutes, it does grind you down. Um, I'm, yeah. We can reset this meeting, yeah, no. by the way. I know. We, I got. I got to get running myself. Oh, Ahmed. okay. Ahmed, we definitely need to do this con conversation again soon. I so enjoyed talking to you, man. Um, definitely lo love what you do. Uh, love your honesty and transparency um, on your channel. And let's, you know, we'll hang out. Hundred percent. A hundred percent. I'll send this recording to you, and uh, I'll I'll see you online. <laughs> All right. Take care, brother. Cheers. Care. See bye you bye. later. I hope you enjoyed that chat between Ahmed and myself. Again, I do apologize for Zoom. It is brutal as a recording a device. Eventually, I'll invest in a proper podcast platform. Uh, but right now, I don't get paid for this. So, hey, that's a good reminder. If you love the show, go check out my website at refsneedlove 2com Get a shirt. Buy one of the referee cards. Buy a coin. All those things goes to support uh, the channel and investments in, in what I do here, whether it's for videos or for podcasts or for the website and all of those types of things. I really do appreciate it. Thank you again for listening and I hope you have a wonderful week. <laughs>